All right, hello, and thank you to everyone for joining us for today's webinar, Understanding Your Pension. My name is Candace Jasbach, and I'm a member of the mobilization team at the PIPS National Office in Ottawa. I'm joined today by John Starrick from our compensation team. John is our subject matter expert on our members' pension. Thanks for joining us today, John. Hello, my pleasure. Before we get started, let's go over some key information about our platform, Zoom. So due to the size of the group today, we've muted all lines to ensure we have the best sound quality for everyone participating and for those who will watch this later. Please use the chat box to send us a message should you have any questions or technical issues during the webinar. My colleague, Catherine Gagnon, is monitoring the Ask a Question account and will be able to help you out. And yes, the session is being recorded and will be circulated to everyone after the fact. So you can always come back and listen in again. All right, so let's start with a quick poll. We're looking to see how you would rate your knowledge of pensions right now. You should see a, the poll pop up on your screen and I'll give you a moment to complete that. All right, I'll give you just a couple more seconds to complete that poll. You can do that by making your selection on your screen there. All right, let's take a look at those results. So we can see that about 36% of folks feel they have no knowledge whatsoever or very little knowledge of pensions. The majority of you, 59%, feel you have some knowledge and about 5% feel they have a lot of knowledge. Great, thank you so much for sharing that uh, feedback with us. It gives us a really great starting point for today's webinar. I'll take this moment to uh, just note that this presentation is designed to give you a high level overview of how your pension works. Pensions are highly technical and governed by legislation, which as we know, can change from time to time. This presentation is designed to give you a general understanding of how pensions work and how your pension supports your future retirement security. You should always contact your HR for specific details and before making any major decisions related to your pension. So let's get started. Today, we will focus on the basics of how different pension types work with a closer look at your specific pension type. We'll talk about the idea of retirement income security and the role your pension plays in that. And then we'll take a look at what PIPS has planned to protect your pension. So, John, can you get us started by simply explaining what a pension is? I think many of us have a general understanding of what a pension is, but also find the details a bit complicated and confusing. For sure. A pension is income received when you're retired. That part is quite simple but where the pension comes from is less understood. Over the course of your working career, both you and your employer would make contributions to your pension plan. For the most part, in a defined contribution plan, you would manage those contributions and how they are invested. And then on retirement, you would purchase some type of uh, pension product. So basically, your pension is for savings on your part and deferred salary on the part of the employer. I think that's a really important point. So employees and employers pay into pensions over time, the money is invested, and upon retirement, the pension comes from those investments. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Your pension is a combination of your savings, your contributions, and deferred compensation from the employer. It's not a big pile of money, though, that you get at retirement. Okay. And there are different types of pensions, right? Yes, yes. There's um, two main types. There's uh, defined benefit pension plans. Uh, most of our members have defined benefit plans. Some of our members are in target benefit plans. This type of pension provides an annual income just like a defined benefit plan that's at retirement, but it isn't guaranteed. 
and some of our members are in defined contribution plans. A defined contribution plan works a little bit differently um, because it doesn't provide an, an annual income. Instead, you're granted access to your funds on retirement, and then you decide what type of payment model you want. Okay. And who governs a pension? Who sets the rules for your pension plan? Uh, well, the rules are set up by provincial legislation, and uh, that's the most important part. The next most important part is a plan document, and a plan document goes over the specifics. For example, what your contribution amount is going to be, the uh, percentage, uh, what funds you have available to you, uh, stuff like that. And I'll remind everyone listening today that this presentation is just to go over the general understanding of how your pension works and to support your future retirement security. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> excuse me, all members that were invited to today's webinar are from groups that have a defined contribution pension plan. I should note that if you are a member of the CR, PEG, WPEG, or WTEG group, and were employed prior to 2015, you are also part of the public service pension plan, which is not a defined contribution plan. At the end of this presentation, we'll share where you can get information on that kind of pension plan on our website, and there are also recordings to a session similar to this that you can listen to. Uh, so John, can you walk us through a defined contribution pension plan in a bit more detail? Sure. Let's start with uh, the contributions. Over the course of your working career, both you and the employer made contributions to the pension plan. Those uh, funds are then invested and these investments are based on choices within a portfolio that's provided in a plan. And you would choose which investments within that portfolio you want to invest in. Then upon uh, your retirement, you're granted access to this pension uh, fund, this account, uh, to purchase some sort of pension product. So your pension, as we were saying before, is essentially uh, your savings and deferred compensation on a part of the employer. Okay, I think that's really important. So under a defined, uh, contrib a defined contribution plan, you get access to the entirety of your pension upon retirement. Is that, am I understanding that right? Well, kind of. Unlike a defined benefit or a target benefit plan, uh, where you would automatically get a pension from the fund, in a defined contribution plan, you're given access to that account that you have, that all the investments that you had. At that point, you would need to purchase some kind of retirement product like an annuity or a risk lift, you know, Lira. Um, to so you get some type of regular income uh, when you retire and you would be purchasing this from like an insurance company or a bank. Uh, the terms of that annuity though, uh, that, that depends on a lot of things uh, like how much money you have in your fund, whether or not you want to include things like indexing, you know, the CPI, cost of living index, uh, if you want to have a survivor pension for your spouse after you pass away, that did depend. Okay, it sounds like there's a lot of flexibility. In general, how does a defined contribution plan compare to other pension types? Well, flexibility is definitely one of the strong points of the defined contribution plan, but they are a little bit less reliable than other plans. You see, because under a defined contribution plan, your contributions are individualized. It's your contribution, the employer contribution, and you're choosing amongst the portfolio what you want to invest in. And so if the market crashes, uh, you're, you're not really protected as well as in a defined benefit plan where the employer-employee contributions go in together, but they're usually professionally managed. But still, a defined contribution plan is better than having no pension plan at all, especially because your employer is matching your contribution. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, how can we protect our defined contribution <coughs> pensions from employers that may want to move away from providing pensions altogether? Well, understanding your pension and how it works is important, but you also need to uh, let your employer know that pensions are important to you. And the best way to do this is to deliver a message along with your union pips, us, that we're going to push back on any moves to undermine your pension plan. And where can our members find more information about their pensions? For example, 
How much could a member expect to receive when they retire? I, I get this question a lot. People keep coming to us saying, can you tell me what my pension's going to be? But we don't have individual pension information. So I have absolutely no idea what your pension's going to be. You need to really go to your HR department and they can provide you with that specific information. Okay. And what happens if a member changes or leaves their job before retirement? What happens to their pension? Well, in that case, you would be provided options, such as moving your pension savings into a locked-in RRSP um, or leaving them inside the plan. Uh, those options are really a personal choice. Your HR department would provide you with that information. Uh, once you have that information, our team is available to discuss those options with you to make sure that you make an informed decision. Okay, that's really helpful. And that's a lot of great information. Now, we know that our workplace pension alone isn't the only part of a secure retirement. Is that right? That's right. Our workplace pension is only one part. You shouldn't stop there. There's more retirement planning to do. Okay. Could you give us a bit more detail? Oh, okay. Uh, well, pensions are considered a three-legged stool. First, you have the government retirement programs. That would include like CPP or QPP, OAS, which is old age security. And if you qualify, you could also uh, get GIS, which is a guaranteed income supplement. So that's the first uh, leg. The second leg is your personal savings. This would include registered retirement savings plan or tax-free savings account or any other savings or investments that you have. And third, of course, is your workplace pension. The three of these together is what provides you uh, with a secure pension for retirement. I see. I know a lot of my friends and family don't have a workplace pension at all. Is that common? Unfortunately, yes. Only about 35% of working Canadians have a workplace pension. And a little bit more than half of those have a defined contribution plan, sort of like the members on this call. Is it possible to get by on just CPP, OAS, and GIS? And even if I count in my personal savings? Well, um, Canadians don't save a lot, and uh, a lot of us have difficulty with that, but government programs alone would probably leave and have left many seniors living in poverty. Um, also today, you know, for young people, you know, they have precarious jobs, being on term all the time, uh, and our term contracts, temporary. So this is setting them up for a precarious retirement. Uh, according to Stats Canada in 2018, only 22% of people who filed taxes in that year in 2018 contributed to their RRSP. And the average household in Canada only saved about $850 that year. That, that's not going to provide a sustainable pension. And this is why PIPS is focused on protecting our members' pensions and why the Canadian labor movement is fighting for protection and for pensions for all Canadians. Thanks for all of that information, John. Uh, before we move on, I want to do another quick poll to see how everyone is feeling. So having heard all of that, how would you now rate your knowledge of pensions? And you should see a, the question popping up on your screen again. So I'll give you a moment just to log your responses. All right, I'll give you just a few more seconds. So if you haven't voted yet, please do. Okay, great. So now we can see that we still have 12% uh, of folks who feel they have no knowledge whatsoever or very little knowledge about pensions but there's been some major movement. Now 85% of folks on the call feel they have some knowledge and uh, about 4% of folks feel they have a lot of knowledge. So I think that's really great. We're seeing folks are uh, sort of moving up that ladder, which is awesome. Yet I'm sure that folks still have a lot of questions for John. So I'll remind folks that you can use the chat box to send a message to my colleague, Catherine, who's monitoring the ask a question account and I will read them out to John. Um, so I have a couple already, which is really awesome. 
Uh, John, this first question comes from Reza, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, they are looking to know, is there a kind of way to ensure security <coughs> in a uh, defined contribution pension against market fluctuations? That might be a tricky one. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And uh, there's really not a good answer for it because each employer that has a defined contribution plan uh, creates their own portfolio of investment options that you can select. And most employers will have anywhere between, well, as few as 12 and as many as, well, 50 or more. But on average, most them provide around 30 or so options. And those options will be right down to like bonds and uh, income trust type thing where you get uh, dividends to, you know, uh, high yield, uh, you know, stocks or, uh, or mutual funds. And so the member, if they're afraid about um, fluctuations in the marketplace, would choose a more conservative portfolio that is more like um, bonds or fixed income rather than going into the actual mutual funds. But then you're also not going to get as big a return potentially as you would if you went into uh, the mutual fund. So it, it's a difficult thing. And this is why, um, you know, you need to learn about what each fund, how it's managed and how it works. Okay. Um, the next question I have is from Chris and it's, it's, it's a bit specific to his case, but I, I hope that uh, other folks on the call might benefit. Uh, Chris says, that um, I chose not to take my severance buyout. And he's looking to know if it can be rolled into his <clears throat> direct, con or I'm assuming defined contribution plan. Okay, so severance is part of the collective agreement. So normally I don't answer questions like this, but um, basically severance, you can do whatever you want with it when you take it out. And uh, you can, bring it into uh, an RRSP. I'm not sure the plan sponsor or the employer would accept um, that severance amount, however much it is, into the pension plan, unless they had uh, like a group RRSP included with the plan. You're not allowed to add additional contributions because the employer wouldn't match those. So you may want to put it into your own RRSP where you can actually choose whichever funds you want uh, to invest in or you can put it into a TFSA. Okay, I think that's helpful information. Um, and I think, you know, there's an important point to be made there too. When we're talking about really specific information or specific questions like that, your HR uh, is definitely sort of in the best position to provide that information because it depends a bit on the provisions of your plan. Is that right? Right. That's exactly it. And once you get that information, if you want to go over it to make sure you understood everything correctly and, and have, uh, you know, explained a little bit to you, we're here to help you with that, but we wouldn't have that information up front. Perfect. Um, I have a question here from Sarah, uh, and her question is, if I work in Ontario, but I live in Quebec, will I receive QPP, uh, the Quebec Pension Plan, or CPP, the Canada Pension Plan? So when you retire, you'll receive QPP or CPP, depending which province you're residing in. So you could have worked your whole career in Ontario, but you live in Quebec, so QPP would pay you. And, and the reverse would work, be true also. If somebody worked in, for example, Montreal their whole life, but when they retired, they moved to, to the Maritimes, uh, then CPP would pay them. And it would be the same amount for uh, QPP or CPP, the, the amount that you would get is the same. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, I have a question for Michael, and uh, they're asking if my workplace, excuse me, <laughs> if my workplace pension makes my retirement income too high, is it possible that I will not receive any CPP or OAS benefits? Well, for CPP uh, or QPP, you will always receive that because you contribute into it so you're not going to be uh, penalized for having you know too much income uh, even millionaires would get CPP and QPP 
but all the security uh, is clawed back if you're make, if you have too much uh, if your earnings are too high. So this year is around eighty thousand uh, where the clawback would start. So if your earnings in retirement are over eighty thousand, OAS would start to be clawed back. And if you're making over one hundred twenty thousand, then you wouldn't receive any old age security at all. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I have a question from Ed sort of goes back to that QPP CPP question. Uh, and he wants to know what happens if you want to retire abroad when it comes to CPP? Does that make any difference? So if you retire abroad, uh, but you have a Canadian address, then it's not uh, an issue. Uh, if you actually uh, move to another country, uh, if there is a reciprocal agreement with that country, then it's not so much of an issue. If there isn't, um, then there could be some issues um, and you would have to look into that before. Uh, I wouldn't know the answers to that because that's something you'd have to deal with Service Canada. But uh, generally speaking, if, uh, if you did still have a residence in Canada, it wouldn't be an issue. But if you didn't, then it would depend on having a reciprocal agreement with that country. Okay, that's a really good point. So CPP, you know, just like any other pension plan, you know, when you're getting into those specific questions, it's good to talk to the administrator. So in that case, it would be Service Canada and they'll have the details on that sort of stuff, right? Exactly. Okay. Uh, I have another question from Carol, um, wondering about how many years she can expect to receive uh, CPP or QPP. So all government uh, pensions like CPP, QPP, all the security go on until you pass away. And then in the case of like CPP and QPP, there is a survivor benefit. So it would, it goes on. If you live to 120, you'll get paid till 120 and it's indexed every year. Uh, all the securities indexed every three months. So the, uh, it only goes up a little bit because it's only every three months. Um, but both of the benefits go right until you retire, until you pass away. Okay, thanks for that. I'm just going to remind folks, if you do have any questions for John, go right ahead and ask them in the chat box, and we are quite happy to, to pass those along. Um, I have a question from George. Uh, I think it's a little bit more of a comment. He, uh, you know, is saying he keeps hearing how pensions are too expensive, that they're creating debt for employers and the government and taxpayers. Is that true? Well, uh, pensions are a benefit that are very important for uh, our members and also for people who don't have any pension. Um, and so when you look at, is it too expensive for companies, uh, for a small company to have a defined benefit pension plan would be very expensive because there's a lot of overhead costs. But for a large company, having a defined benefit plan uh, is almost no cost. Uh, the fine contribution plan uh, has very different types of costs. And are they unreasonable? I mean, that's up to each employer to decide. But one of the things that pensions does, having these pension plans, is that it gives you a solid retirement so that you're not um, falling back on government's handouts when, you know, when you're over 65, because that increases taxes at that time because you don't have a pension, so governments have to pay you more so that you don't go into poverty. And so it becomes a vicious circle. So having pensions is a fantastic way of the government saving future debt. Okay. Um, I have a question from Julia, and I think this is our last question for the day. Um, her question is, if we have CPP, do we need an RRSP or another form of savings? Well, again, this uh, depends on you personally and how much money you want to have uh, in retirement. Uh, some people you know, don't need a lot of money to, uh, to, to get on and other people need more. What I would suggest is on Service Canada website, there is a retirement calculator that you can mark down you, know, you could also check with CPP or Service Canada how much your CPP will be. Uh, the maximum this year is just over $13,000, but almost nobody gets the maximum. So the average 
uh, CPP payout right now is about, it's less than $9,000 a year. So if you say, okay, I'm the average person and I'm going to get 9,000 from CPP, it's tax. And uh, then you'll be getting about 6,000 from all these securities. So that brings you up to 15,000. Well, that's taxable as well. And um, uh, I don't think people could live off of that. So now if they have their pension on top of that, then let's say that's another $15,000. Well, now you're up to $30,000, but that's, again, it's all tax. So you're down to 21000 If you feel that you could live off that, you know, then you, you, you might be okay. But if you don't know how big your pension is going to be, uh, I just assume that $15,000, that could be less for people. Um, then you need to put money into an RSP so that uh, you, you have uh, additional savings to fall back upon. All right, I actually am going to take one more question from Gabrielle, and I'm not sure, John, if this is sort of your area, but if you're able to answer, that would be awesome. Uh, Gabrielle's question is, my RSP has no contribution room since I have been part of uh, this pension. I'm assuming she's the defined contribution uh, pension. What Will this always be the case? Does that um, make sense to you? Yeah, so uh, for your pension, the, the amount that a person is allowed to put aside into their pension is called their pension adjustment, their PA. And you'll probably see this when you're filing your taxes. So your PA, if I remember correctly, is 18% of what you, you earn. So using round numbers, um, if you earn $100,000, then your PA would be 18,000. And if your contributions with your employer are 9% apiece, then you would have no room for RSPs type thing. But RSP is not the only investment vehicle out there. You could also, you also have your savings, you know, your uh, savings account, and you also have TFSAs, which um, are different in some ways superior to RSPs, in other ways not. But, um, you know, that is another very good savings vehicle rather than the RSP. Okay, great. That's super helpful information. All right, everyone, thank you so much for your questions. Um, so I, I just want to note for folks that we will be sharing contact information at the end of this presentation. So please follow up if you still have any questions that we weren't able to answer today. However, I do really want to note that PIPS does not have access to your personal pension information. So we're not able to provide you information about how much you can expect to receive at retirement or things like that. And, um, you know, John has a ton of fantastic knowledge, but we're also not financial advisors. So you'll want to seek out resources to support you in sort of those avenues. Um, but let's go over some of that information that is available to you. So for your government retirement programs, we recommend visiting the Government of Canada's website, their public pensions page. There you'll find a lot of great information about CPP, QPP, OAS, and GIS, as well as a calculator to help you understand your personal pension benefit. And John was talking about that earlier. For your personal savings options, so your RRSPs, your TFSAs, and any other savings uh, vehicles you want to look into, there are resources available to you. You should get in touch with your financial institution or an independent financial advisor to navigate those. And for your workplace pension, you should contact your HR department. They're the folks that can provide you with your specific plan information. So before we let you go, I want to give you a sneak peek at what's next for PEPs. Today, we really only scratch the surface when it comes to pensions and retirement income security. Pensions are incredibly technical and we could easily talk for hours. Today's session is about giving you a broad understanding of your pension and how it works so that you can begin planning for your own retirement. And that planning should include working to protect your workplace pension. This fall, PIPS will be launching our Protecting Pensions campaign. And this campaign will take members to the next step from understanding their pensions and retirement security to action. We will be hosting more webinars, launching some great tools and working with members to lead initiatives in their workplace, including uh, activities for folks who continue to work from home. So keep an eye out for an email about our first actions. Lastly, let's review everything we covered today. We discussed the basics of how different pension types work with a closer look at your specific pension type. The idea, idea of retirement income security and the role your pension plays in that. And then we talked about our upcoming campaign and what you can expect to see from PIPs this fall. 
And that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you again to all of you for joining us today. Big thank you to John for his expertise and to Catherine for managing our uh, chat box and the questions. If you do have any outstanding questions about this presentation, our upcoming campaign to protect pensions, or frankly anything at all, please feel free to email us at bettertogetherpips.ca, as you see up on the screen. If there's anything we didn't get to today, uh, send us an email and we will get back to you. Thank you again so much for your time and have a great afternoon.